Uh, this is usually our health segment, and we're going to ha ha probably have Dr. David Samani on in just a bit. But one of the things I've always wanted to ask uh, any doctor, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. And uh, I think a lot of women make this decision. Certainly a lot of people in so show business uh, make this decision, you know, whether or not to have plastic surgery. It's, a, it's an important issue. And there's pros and cons to it. You know, I, I've thought about it myself. I've, you know, I'm getting older. Uh, I'm on TV. I'm in the media. And, uh, you know, I make those decisions. Uh, you know, will I make that decision to do it? I don't know. I'm going to ask the good doctor if I should or not. You know, I don't want to end up like Burt Reynolds. Uh, or what are some of the other ones that, uh, my God, some of the other ones are, are, are like uh, uh, Meg Ryan. Just looks like the Joker. So I'm going to ask the doctor about it. And I think he's with us via Skype. Uh, Dr. David Samani, Chairman of Urology and Chief of Robotic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital and also Professor of Urology at Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine. Doctor, welcome. Uh, if your title gets any longer, we're going to have to devote a whole show to you. I know. The whole segment is becoming the title. Um, <laughs> but uh, i got to tell you, uh, we just joined the healthcare system. And yesterday, the whole North Shore LIJ system were nice enough to give me the tour of the medical school. And, you know, it's a real healthcare system of 17, 18 hospitals. And it's amazing. My role is to run the Department of Urology at Lenox Hill. So we're excited about it, and it's been a really good change for us. Thank you. Congratulations. I, I was just talking about, I don't know if you heard the tease, but I was just talking about a plastic surgery. And I know it's something that, that you... That you looked at extensively and you, you're, you, you really study everything, but I have a concern. I've thought about, I've thought about doing it, and uh, I'm sure a lot of women do it, but I also see the horror stories that people go too far with it. Uh, what's the end result? Is it, is it something to consider or should it be avoided? Well, you know, I can tell you that as a surgeon, um, I always say that surgery should be really the last resort. Because unlike medical therapy or injections and other things, surgery is not always reversible. So you have to be really sure that this is the answer and that's going to make it better, whether it's plastic surgery or surgeries for prostate cancer, etc. Having said that, you always have to really look at the risk and benefit. For people who absolutely need this and it's necessary, then I think surgery is the best way to go. Then ultimately it comes down to the experience of the surgeon. And that's absolutely the final answer. The surgeon that you choose, you have to make sure you ask all the right questions. How many of these cases do you do? What kind of results do you have? Can I talk to some of your patients that are similar to what you're going through and ask for complications, et cetera? And, 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 you know, all the surgeons reputations are out there and it's easy to find out who is doing a high volume, who is hands on, and then you have a good outcome. It, um, let yeah. me ask you, let me ask you this doctor, because what, when I, when I see it done and I've had friends who have done it. And one of the things I notice uh, that, especially with facial sur uh, surgery where, especially for women where they try to, you know, regain their youth and get rid of the wrinkles. And I guess it's some sort of nip and tuck type yeah. of operation and when they're just standing there and they're not smiling it looks beautiful it looks fine and then when they smile uh like meg ryan it, it has this almost like joker like look and yeah. and frankly it, it looks hideous is there a way to maybe is there a point in the middle where it, it just really looks good i agree with you that as a society we're really overdoing it there's too much botox going on and i think this whole hollywood fashion is, is almost like a virus that's spreading the entire U.S. And more and more people, they think they go to these medical spas and they get these injections and they come out and they look much more attractive. And based on some of the studies that we're looking at right now, we see that they may, may make them look younger, but obviously a lot of times it's not natural, as you mentioned. It doesn't look real. It, it, there are some side effects from some of these Botox injections and plastic surgeries. So you've got to be really careful. There's no question that it's being overdone, and a lot of these surgeries are unnecessary. So you want to be careful. Yeah, I, one, of, one of the studies you point to, uh, it, it may not be may look better, and, and people may see that, what I'm seeing. The baby, exactly. This is a study that just recently came out, and they compare, and they had like 50 participants looking at the patients before and after, even though it was only one surgeon's data, and it's not a great study, 
But what they found out is that it really doesn't, they didn't think that these patients are becoming more attractive. Right. They thought that it's becoming younger, and certainly surgery is making a difference, but in a big picture, it's not making them look more attractive. So uh, unless it's done for a good reason in the hands of experienced surgeons, I would say think uh, twice about it. Let me go to this other report uh, that, that I saw recently about uh, the cancer dilemma and uh, over-treatment. And I guess one of the things that really strikes me in this report is that we seem to be, a, be able to identify, we have new tests available, and we're able to identify diseases and things like cancer and perhaps other things as well uh, at a far earlier stage. And I guess the question is, are, are too many people using surgery as an option when maybe they should be giving it a little more time? I think, um, well, this debate is, 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 is continuing. The jury is still out. And so we've got to be careful because there are a lot of times you see that there's multiple areas of breast or prostate that may have cancer, and the doctor may say, let's do watch for waiting. And when you remove the prostate, you realize that there's a lot more cancer than what we thought. So in those cases, you may jeopardize someone's life. Having said that, I think as a result of screening, we're finding out more and more cancers earlier on, and also some of them are precancerous lesions that may or may not translate into cancer, and surgery for those is probably not necessary. No question that when you hear the word cancer, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of emotions involved, people are fearful, and the possibility of the cancer being spread. So I think that, you know, with the advent of genetic studies, certainly with ma many MRIs coming in our life, uh, we are uh, trying to really isolate and find out which cancer is the one that's going to uh, kill the patient and which one we can watch. And we're getting better at it, even though it's not perfect yet. I think the future of this is going to be all in genes and genetic studies to distinguish same cancer in two different people, which one is going to have a different kind of behavior and that would be the day that we really can say surgery or no surgery. Until then, I think a lot of patients um, overreact, and I can completely understand why they're afraid of the cancer. And to some extent, doctors may be overtreating because obviously when the cancer is still contained, the cure rate is high, but once it spreads, it's a whole different ballpark. So there is no question that there's some overtreatment uh, is going on, but that's because our diagnostic tools are not really great at this point. I went through the scare myself. Uh, it was a number of years ago. I had something very minor, just uh, cancer on the on the tip of my nose, and I was terrified by it. And I went to the doctor, get this out of here. Uh, I do not, you know, and what I had was obviously not life-threatening, and it was frightening. But well, it also brings up the story of Angelina Jolie. Uh, yeah. what she did. I mean, you know, radical surgery uh, without cancer present, but because her, genetic is, her genetics are predisposed. I mean, well, what do you think of that? Well said. And I think that in cases like that, where there's a strong family history, the aunt had it, she has it. And that's one of the reasons why, I'm not sure if you know or not, but we just opened up a big prostate cancer center in the heart of Manhattan, and for anybody that's diagnosed with prostate cancer or precancerous lesion for prostate cancer or elevated PSAs, they can call the office and the number is easy to remember. You, perhaps you want to tell them it's 212-365-5000 and we get calls from all over the country, 212-365-5000 and I will basically study it and find out if it's really precancerous or if it's a real cancer. And you know, sometimes it's, it's good to have those radical procedures like Angelina Jolene because it saves lives. And sometimes I may tell, may tell the patient, absolutely, we're gonna follow you in three months, just a blood test and don't do it. So that personalized medicine and the way we take care of our patients is very critical. And your point is well taken. Doctor, uh, that number you just gave us, was that for your office? Is, is yes. That, was, okay, great. Yes, so don't forget that. This is the Cancer Institute, Atlantic Hill, and the number is 212 Three six five five thousand for anybody that's diagnosed with prostate cancer, elevated PSAs, or precancerous lesions related to prostate. Uh, the staff are ready, and I'm happy to help them personally. Uh, that's a fantastic thing to do. Uh, thank you for that number. We'll give it out again uh, a little later. Uh, the other, the other item that I saw out there, and I, I'm going to have to ask you to explain this to me. Talk to me about what I, what they call the MERS virus, M-E-R-S. 
Yes, this is a Middle Eastern virus that has been causing a lot of, um, you know, noise in the last year or so. Um, we covered this on Sunday house call a couple of times. It basically causes respiratory infections and, and um, you know, some wheezing and fever, etc. It started in mostly Saudi Arabia. It's been traveling mostly in the Middle East. But of course, because of this global travel and, and the people traveling from one place to another, there's some suspicious that now we're seeing more and more cases in London, in Germany, and in France, and it's slowly spreading. Now, everyone has been watching this very carefully. There's only about 49 cases of death in the whole world. In a big picture, even though that sounds like a big number, in the big picture, I don't think it's really as serious as, as the media has made it sound. Certainly, in most hospitals in the U.S., we're watching it carefully. I don't know of any major serious cases in U.S., but that's one of the reasons why we need to be aware of this. How, is it, have, how is it transmitted, doctor? It's from person to person and, and certainly through uh, droplets. And if you have fever, if you have fatigue, if you have a fever of unknown origin, if you have cough and uh, some of those symptoms that's not going away after a few days, you need to make sure that you check in and you speak to your doctor um, and see if it's one of those viruses. That's you know, it's that, time, it's that time of year where a lot of people go on vacation right now. Are there certain areas of the world where you're more likely to catch this disease? Well, certainly in Jordan, in Kuwait, in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, these are the, like really the hub of this particular virus. And uh, there's really nothing, no vaccination against this. And if you have any of those symptoms, Basically, the treatment is supportive to give them IV fluid and Tylenol and make sure that the virus would, you know, will pass. And the dehydration is a big part of this. But so far, we don't have a lot of cases in the U.S. I would not panic, but I would keep our eyes open and see, you know, whether it's going to travel to come here. Just uh, for our own protection here in the United States, for people coming into the country, uh, through, they're immigrating to the country or they're just here on a visa and they're just here to travel and visit, uh, do they do anything at the border to, to check on this? Are there any vaccines? How, how do we protect ourselves here and keep well, it from getting in the United States? It's almost impossible because, really? you know, you have anybody that would start coughing in one of those closed uh, planes and with all the, you know, uh, air flowing, floating in the inside of the plane, uh, anybody would be susceptible to this. So there's really no screening process when it comes to this. Again, again, this is not one of those SARS or real global problem, even though it's been <coughs> sitting around now for about a year or so. The number of patients we see infected as a result of this for the period and the duration that has been around are fairly small. And that's one of the reasons why I said there's no reason to panic. Well, um, we'll see how it's going to pan out okay. in the next few weeks or months. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, it's good to know that we don't have to panic on that. And thanks so much again, as always. Uh, welcome Absolutely. back. It's good to have you here every Friday. Thank you so much. That, of course, was Dr. David Samad.